I'm prepared to lead our conference to doing what we said we would do in the election. We actually ran on a repeal and replace plan. That's what this is, the repeal and replace plan we ran on. Now I am intent on making sure that we fulfill our promises. What I want to tell my fellow citizens is that the nightmare of Obamacare is about to end. That we are doing what we said we would do in this campaign, which is repeal and replace this awful law that is crashing. All right, Speaker of the House Paul Ryan vowing to fulfill the GOP's promise to repeal and replace Obamacare. President Trump met earlier this evening with members of the Freedom Caucus to discuss the new health care bill. As I said last night, they need to hammer out their differences because we cannot have a GOP civil war breaking out in the media. It's only going to hurt their ability to get things done, and that means hurt you, the American people. We continue now more with Newt Gingrich. The Club for Growth, Heritage Action, Americans for Prosperity, Freedom Works, the Freedom Caucus, some members of the study committee, Rand Paul, Mike Lee, Ted Cruz, Marco Rubio, are against this bill. Here's my question. This has been discussed as their primary agenda item, Mr. Speaker, for eight years. They released the bill, they roll out a bill yesterday, and there's not consensus. Why didn't they, why didn't they build the consensus, finish the bill in the square that you told me about, how legislation gets made, how the sausage gets made, before they rolled it out, and then have, maybe I'm envisioning something that could never happen. A president, with every Republican House member, every Republican senator behind him, this is our answer to Obamacare, and we're all in agreement, we're going to pass it today. Am I, am I naive to think that something like that could have happened rather than the squabbling that's going on on TV the last 24 hours? Well, I think, I think it might have been done, but it'd be very, very hard. Uh, I think there are two key things to remember about where we are. The first is this bill is the beginning of a three or four or five step process. This is not the only bill that's going to come down the but road on health But they knew what the criticisms were before within their sure. own ranks. And, and you can divide the criticisms in a couple of ways. One is, if, if you want to pass something very early, you're going to have to pass it under Senate reconciliation rules. Okay. That's just a fact. Right. Now, if, if that's what you're going to do, those rules define narrowly what can be in the bill. Understood. So at least, at least half the complaints are about a reality that, that Paul Ryan and Mitch McConnell are working with. Second, and that's legitimate, by the way. That's all true, yeah, that's 100%. Right. right. Second, in the Senate, the margin is closer than it looks because it takes 50 votes plus Vice President Pence. That means you could lose two. Now, that's you could it. lose two on the right. You can lose two on the left. You can lose two in the middle over things like, like for example, uh, whether or not they're going to have opioid uh, treatments or they're going to drop them. Uh, which for somebody like Senator Portman, who's made an enormous number of speeches on the opioid epidemic, really is central to him. It's not a right or left issue. It's a practical issue. So you have all this stuff going on at once. I think I probably would, would frankly, have been pretty close to what Paul Ryan did. Bring a bill out, go to markups, allow amendments. Then they go from energy and commerce and ways and means to a markup uh, in the budget committee of the combined bill. Then you go to the Rules Committee and remember, look, the Freedom Caucus can walk in and say, we want to put these, these amendments in order. Uh, and they can say, we're not going to vote for the rule unless we get some amendments. This is the legislative process. My only point would be, and I, and I, think, I think it's fair from Paul Ryan's standpoint, uh, to, to be slightly perplexed. I mean, this is not a perfect bill. This, I want to emphasize. This is the first of five or six reform efforts uh, that are going to come out during the course of the year. Well, Tom Price uh, last night said that there's, this is going to be rolled out three different ways. So right. well, that actually made me feel a little better, but I wish well, they he, would have explained it better. Yeah, I, I think had they started originally, and I, and I agree with this, and I think it's the one criticism that they, they and the president should take to heart. If they had started by saying, let us give you a context, you're going to get a first bill designed to get through the Senate. Not designed to be perfect, designed to get through the Senate so the president can sign it as rapidly as possible. Big step towards repeal. And guess what? You're not going to get any Democrats. No Democrats nope, going to vote never. to repeal this. Right. Never. Right. So that means you've got to carry a narrow burden. Maybe, uh, maybe you, I would have liked to have seen a, maybe a lot of these things resolved behind the scenes first. Maybe I'm naive. Well, no. I just think there's some stuff sometimes... In the, and, and, I, and I do think if you look, for example, at the Medicaid reform, it may be the biggest conservative reform 
uh, since the Welfare Reform Bill of 96. Look, I mean, it's, 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 these, these are not better. small things. But well, they've got to remember, they're going to now own this. They better get it right. Well, and they and they better plan on a second bill, and they better plan on on Tom Price uh, doing yeah. a series of, of regulatory changes. This this dance will go on all year. But I want to say one other thing that's really important: the Republicans cannot allow the Trump administration to fail on this first big effort. When you get done fighting, you get done complaining, you get done amending, virtually every Republican ought to vote yes. We'll have another fight in six weeks or two months, but we, it's very important. I agree. That President Trump have a win Big on time. this bill. Big time. I totally agree with that. Mr. Speaker, always good to see you. Thank you. Great. Thanks. All right, we have more reaction to the explosive WikiLeaks allegations. Bill Binney, retired Lieutenant Colonel Tony Schaefer, and then later, a new report says President Obama is furious with President Trump. Well, all we've learned in recent weeks with all that, shouldn't it be the other way around? Michelle Malcolm will weigh in on that on this busy, super busy news night. If you want a sophisticated analysis, uh, go to Andy McCarthy's new column on this very topic. Uh, McCarthy was the prosecutor in 1993 who convicted the terrorist who bombed the original World Trade Center bombing back in 93. He's had a 20-year experience looking at these things, does so as a, having been a professional Justice Department prosecutor. Uh, he thinks there's a lot here. Uh, he thinks that there are some very troubling things about how the executive branch under President Obama behaved, uh, and he thinks it's absolutely worth digging out and understanding what went on. And he points out that um, it's very unlikely that the FBI happened to go in October uh, to ask for a wiretap and, get, and got it from the uh, FISA court uh, with nobody in the uh, Obama White House knowing they were doing it. Uh, I mean, to get, to get a wiretap that included a presidential campaign in the last weeks of the campaign is a pretty extraordinary request. And that's McCarthy's point, that to think this happened to be done by some bureaucrats with no supervision when you know, for example, that the attorney general spent an hour in secret with Bill Clinton just before uh, they dropped charges against his wife. I and mean, all this stuff uh, smells to high heaven, despite the best efforts of the elite media to cover it up. Well, I mean, what about that? You just heard Mark Levin's uh, commentary on this. Mar Mark Levin was on Fox and Friends going through points of evidence that showed that the Obama administration did, in fact, make two requests to the Foreign Intelligence uh, Surveillance Court uh, FISA, and the first one was denied, but then the second one was accepted. It sure looks like maybe the, you know, I mean, look, the White House, uh, uh, the uh, Obama White House, rather, has put out this statement basically saying, trying to uh, distance themselves from this entire story, that they did not order uh, any of this surveillance. But we know that there were requests to put in a wiretap at Trump Tower. Right. So, so when you look at it, and, you, and this, this is the point that Andy McCarthy makes this morning, you look at all this stuff and you notice how carefully they worded it. They didn't order it, okay? Did they know about it? Did they approve it? Did they allow the FBI to do it? Uh, and you have to ask yourself the question, what did they think? You know, remember, the only person who's ever been in the Trump official campaign who has ever been in any way involved about all this is Paul Manafort, and that was because of his Ukrainian ties, not Russia. And Paul had been gone for months, and Paul's a good guy. I'm not alleging anything with Paul, but he'd been gone for months. So what's their case? What, what the devil are they trying to do in this circumstance? Right, right. Well, we still don't know what exactly they're suggesting. I mean, why, in any event, I mean, people have meetings with ambassadors and senators all the time, well, but, but we still don't <laughs> understand what they're trying to charge in terms of these, these Russian meetings. But look at what uh, John Favreau, who was a speechwriter for President Obama, uh, points out, and he basically says, I would be careful uh, to, uh, you know, about reporting that Obama said there was no wiretapping. The statement that the White House, the Obama White House released was that neither he nor the uh, White House actually ordered it. So it, we are parsing words a bit here, aren't we? Well, well we are, and, it's, and, it's, and it's very funny if you think about it, because you have this circumstance, you know, if, if, if the New York Times had any hope of ever being neutral, uh, one of the things they could do is simply print all of the pictures of all the Democrats meeting with the Russian ambassador. Hmm. Because you have this whole series of people who are shocked 
that Senator Sessions, as a senator, met with the Russian ambassador. And then you began to get, you know, Nancy Pelosi was meeting with the Russian ambassador. Uh, Claire McCaskill, sen senator from Missouri, was meeting with the Russian ambassador. Right. I mean, all these things began to come out. And you began to realize this is an absurdity. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think one of the things we have to recognize, and, and I keep trying, frankly, to say this to the, the Trump team over and over again. They have a group of people who are their mortal enemies. The New York Times is one of them. Right. The Post is one of them. These folks are going to be against them every day. Mm. They're going to attack them every day. Uh, and they have to understand that they're living in a hostile environment. Yeah, well, we're just trying to figure out if there was actually illegality done. I mean, you know, uh, 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 Corey Lewandowski but, told Judge Janine last night that uh, then-Senator Jeff Sessions was also wiretapped, uh, and they were bugging um, his conversations as well. Well, we're, well Fred, we're, let me just say, real quick. If, if, if they were actually wiretapping a United States senator, that is a very serious problem. Yeah. Uh, whether it's legal or illegal, it yeah. is so dangerous to our freedoms, no matter who the senator is, yeah. uh, that we'd have to not understand it. All right. We will leave it there. Great to see you, Newt. Thanks so much. Thank